A St. Louis photojournalist shares his experience in Ferguson. That's next on City Corner. I'm Steve Potter and welcome to City Corner. Uh, Wiley Price has been a photojournalist on the staff of the St. Louis American since 1981. He's won many awards over the years for his work and he joins us today. Hi Wiley, thanks for being here. Hi, thank you Steve. I have a lot to talk to you about today and part of that is uh, your coverage of the events in Ferguson um, following the grand jury decision not to indict the police officer that shot Michael Brown, and we'll talk about that. But you began your career, I think, am I right, in 1979? Yes. Mm -hmm. So in all those years of covering the news, have you ever covered anything as dramatic or compelling, or you choose the word? Um, somewhat. I, I, I actually shot the, the march on Forsyth County, Georgia, back in 1985. Uh, I don't and, know that. Okay, that was a big uh, race issue that went down in Forsyth County, Georgia, about a, maybe 50 miles outside of Atlanta, uh -huh. during the Martin Luther King weekend, the, like one of the first couple of years that when we were celebrating his birthday, and they had a big race riot down there, so people were attacked. We came back the next week, and they were hoping to get about five or 10,000 protesters, and 30,000 people showed up and pretty much shut down the entire city. Wow. So that, that was pretty dramatic for me. So there were some, some similarities between yes, those two. Yes, because yeah. uh, violence took place while we were there, and it made me think about the 60s, civil rights marches in the 60s, and it really scared me. I had never been in that situation before. So this one kind of reminds me of that. Is that when you were freelancing for the Associated Press? I was actually a staffer at the St. Louis American and freelancing at the AP at the same time. Uh -huh. Yeah, so going down there, getting on the bus, particularly when you're on the bus on the way there and a guy stands up who's a medical doctor and tells all the women and the men to take off all your jewelry for safety purposes because they'll rip the, the jewelry from your ears and that kind of things. I was like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? And, and what year was that again? 1985. Was that one of those things afterwards you thought, well, that's probably like the most um, intense thing I'll ever cover? Did yeah, you probably think exactly. that? Yes, I did think that. I said, I'll never do that again. I'll never be in that situation again, ever. Hmm. Well, we uh, fast forward yes. <laughs> to 2014, and we have a, a number of the photographs, about a dozen that you took um, at Ferguson. Let's look at the first one. Okay. And just tell me what you remember about taking this particular shot. All right. We're talking with photojournalist Wiley Price. Uh, this is just last Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, when um, Ferguson October did a march on City Hall. And we got there, they tried to push their ways into the doors of City Hall, and they couldn't. So we came back outside, we're sitting on the steps. All of a sudden, the riot police show up, and they started arresting people almost instantly. And, and why they arrested that guy, I do not know, because uh, he was not at the front doors of City Hall. When I was standing there, he never got to the doors. So they, I think that they just picked people out at random and arrested three people. How hard is it for you to be, um, to, to be neutral or not to feel pulled into the moment? I mean, you're a human being mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're there, mm -hmm. but uh, you're there doing a job, so you, you're, I guess, supposed to be emotionally detached, I guess. Yes. So uh, how, how do you approach that? You're not emotionally detached because when you're in the emotion, you're part of it. So my biggest frustration was I felt like the policing could have been done a lot better as far as who they police. Uh, I mean, there were lots of peaceful protests that got aggravated by the police policing them. And I, I even knew police officers there. I was like, why are you moving us? Just let us stand right here. You've got them in a stationary location. Let them march in this general area. Don't touch it. If there was even one time, uh, one day, uh, Don Lemon of CNN was going live and they were moving us down the street while he was on there and I was like, do you realize this guy's going live? So, and even, you know, it looked like the protesters were shoving him down the street and they were, but it was because we were being moved by the police department. And when they got us to where they wanted us, I was like, what is the purpose of being right here? 
it's the same thing. You've only moved us 100 yards, if that. So, you know, it, 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 it really heightened the tension between the protesters and the police. I imagine you had some incredible conversations with both police and protesters during your time there. Yes, yes. Uh, there, were, there are lots of police on site that disagree with the way it's being handled by their department. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of protesters questioning why it was being done. And, and both sides had very good questions about why we were doing the things we were doing. Let's take a look at another one of your photographs. Were, were all these published, by the way? Yes. Uh, this was the day of the National March, that, that Saturday, uh, like back in October. And I've, 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 I've always been amazed by the amount of non-African Americans participating in all of these marches. Not one protest has been all African American. I mean, denominations across the board, race across the board, everybody is participating. So when I listen to talk radio during the day and I hear comments from callers going, well, those people, I'm saying those people as in color or those people as in citizens of the United States. Now, Wiley, I have a background <coughs> in talk radio, so you know as well as I do, you can't listen to half those people, right? <laughs> it's very frustrating because, you know, the, you, you have this one side of, of the society that wants to make it a African-American thing, there's the other part of society that's going, it's not African-American, it's all of us. And the latter is correct. It is all of us. It's about all of us. Yeah, but uh, since you bring that up, let's delve into that for just a second. Um, if you didn't live there, if you weren't there at the site to experience what happened in Ferguson like you did, if you just watched it on the TV news, and I don't, I'm not, not saying they do it on purpose, maybe it's just the way things have to be, you do sort of get a distorted view uh, it looked very violent, uh, very did. threatening, and I know from I know a lot of reporters that were there too, and they mm -hmm. echo what you just said that it was not all bad. Right. There was love there, and a lot of good people trying to do good things, but mm -hmm. that doesn't come across uh, at the uh, at the news at nine o'clock or whenever. No, it doesn't, especially for the national media. They really made it look like the city's on in martial law, twenty four hours a day, and it's not. And you know, I understand that they need action, but sometimes in showing that, you're not showing the, the complete picture. I mean, very few national media came back the next day to show people coming over to help clean up. Right. That wasn't shown. What was shown was the violence the night before. If it bleeds, it leads. There Isn't that go. the old thing exactly. they say in the TV yes, newsrooms? Is. Let's look at another one of your shots. Uh, this is a well-known priest. I've known this man for about as long as I've been at the St. Louis American. And to see him watching down the street in a cardinal jersey holding up that sign, there's the civil courts building right behind him. I mean, you talk about being in the right place at the right moment. And he's such a nice guy. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, and again, the diversity of this movement is unquestionable. Let's go to another shot. Uh, this is when all the ministers got together on that Monday morning when it rained, it, it monsooned on the so badly, and this, this is right before it started raining. And those are, that's, that whole line is nothing but ministers. And again, we, we started at, at 9 a.m., and at 9 a.m., we had two or 300 people standing there waiting, and we're marching towards the Ferguson Police Department. I'm guessing, Wiley, was there a time that you were there every day? Uh, no, I, I've never been there every day, ever. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Lawrence Bryan, my other photographer, who's done a wonderful job of shooting the things that happen at night, I would say after 10 or 11 o'clock. He's been there all night long, and I've only been there during the day, from probably noon till about 10 o'clock. And then, you know, I, I say, okay, I'm done here, and I go home. Yeah. Let's look at another shot, and then I want to ask you about that very first day. Uh, this is front of the uh, old courthouse just two weeks ago. Uh, you try to capture a moment that really sums up what's going on here. And for, for this one, it did. She's got the shirt on. The guy standing behind her has on this wool scarf because it's cold outside. So he kind of gives you that look like, you know, he's one of the bad guys. And you have the police officer underneath the flag, which is upside down. And then the, and the arch, arch in the behind back. I mean, you yes. couldn't have planned that photograph no, and, better. And, and pictures like this, you kind of turn around, and there it is in your face. You recognize it instantly. Well, you bring that up, a great shot like that. And I know photographers, and they take, uh, you know, dozens of pictures to get a good one. Hundreds. Right. Hundreds. So do you, you probably don't even know how many individual uh, photographs you took all together, do you? No, I don't. But it's probably approaching fifteen to 20,000. 
Because even the, the first two or three weeks when I was there like every day or every other day, it was mounting quickly. And I'm, I'm the kind of photographer, like you said, I do shoot a lot of images. I want to make sure I got just the right moment. Do you, know, uh, do you know that when you have a good one necessarily automatically, like when you took the one we just looked at, or does it take you, uh, I mean, do you need to go back and look at them later, or sometimes at the time, do you know that I got that one? When we were shooting film, it was that. You know, you, you, you take a good shot, but you don't really know what it looks like. You saw it through the viewfinder and it looked right. And sometimes when you see it through the viewfinder, it doesn't look right once you sit down and you've calmed down and you see it and you go, nah, this doesn't have the impact that I thought it did. But with digital, you know, you can actually cheat. You hit the button on the back of the camera, see the picture and go, yes. Right. And move on. Right. Let's look at another one. These are the photographs of Wiley Price, who is with the St. Louis American. This is the night of the verdict. And we're standing out in front of the Ferguson Police Department. And you talk about live streaming. There's about 400 people standing there. Everybody has their cell phone on. And we're listening to McCullough give this announcement. And right as he said, said it, she gets emotional immediately. And it was such a powerful shot for me. This one, I kept saying to myself, please be sharp. Please be sharp. Because we're shooting at night. I'm using my flash. And normally, we don't use our flash at night. But in this case, I had to. I said, I got to turn my flash on and get this well lit. Mm -hmm. If anything goes down the way I think it's going to go down, and it did. You're, you're, uh, you're a photographer, but uh, you have a lot of conversations with some of your subjects, I'm sure. Did you get to know Michael Brown's parents at all? Did you have conversations with them? No, I didn't. As a matter of fact, uh, the first night of the candlelight vigil, I didn't even realize I had photographed his father until after I got home. I was like, oh, that's his father. I remember that guy. So I had to go fishing back through my images and edit all the way through. I had him multiple times. And so after that, I realized who the real players were as far as his parents were concerned and family members. Mm -hmm. Is there one person at all that you met that stands out, just a stranger, maybe you had a 30-second conversation with in the street? Anything that jumps out at you? Oh, you know, normally, um, every day you run into conversation with strangers where their opinion is right on point of what they think is going on. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes, I think people get the fairness and the unfairness of a situation. And even I had a police officer tell me a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know, my son is looking at me kind of funny because he's a, he was a, he's a junior in high school. And he said, he said to me, he said, Dad, you know, the police are not like one of our favorite people right now. He said, and for your son to say that to you, he said, it took, it said, it took me a minute not to take it personally. He said, especially coming from my son. He said, I understand young people thinking that way. He said, and I had to, to remind myself that my son is also one of those young people. We need to take a break. We're talking with Wiley Price. He's a photojournalist with the St. Louis American. He's covered uh, the events in Ferguson. And when we come back, I want to ask you about that very first, that very first night when they announced the grand jury verdict and what that was like okay. being there. We'll be back right after this. I'm Steve Potter. Welcome back to City Corner. My guest today is Wiley Price. He's been a longtime photojournalist for the St. Louis American newspaper, and he's covered the events in Ferguson ever since the Michael Brown shooting. He's our guest today. And why don't we immediately go to another photograph, Wiley, that you took in Ferguson, and you can tell us exactly what you remember about the shot. Okay. We looked at that one last time, yes, and I remember you were... You said something about that you didn't know why they arrested that Yeah, guy. I mean, it seemed like they, they picked somebody out and, and just drug him off. Uh, the three people that were arrested that day, I didn't understand why they were arrested because I didn't see them do anything that made me think, oh, I need this picture. I didn't, need, I didn't need the picture until they arrested him. It's got to be a little hard for you, too, though. I mean, you're probably thinking about 10 things at once, aren't you? Yeah, and, you know, you're, you're trying not to also get shoved into the mix. You're, and, and hurt. Right, and, be, and because even. there's so many photographers, they, they don't understand the culture of how to stay back. They want to walk up to it. Right. And when they do that, now they're in the shot. And I'm saying, but you know, you're putting yourself into the situation. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this was a Mother's Day uh, march uh, for the children at, uh, that started in front of the St. Louis County Prosecutor's Office. And this lady's son was violently murdered, and they never found the, the shooter. And mm -hmm. I, I thought that whole picture summed it up with pictures of her son, 
her uh, niece comforting her. I, I thought it said something. Yeah, you feel the emotion in that one. Yes. Let's take a look at one more. Uh, this was the shutdown of Highway 70 at Hanley. We never made it to the highway. We uh, took a jig there and did Hanley instead. And uh, people were free to get down on their knees and say, don't shoot, with, with traffic all around us. So uh, that, that was another situation where the police really did a good job of herding us from one spot to another and keeping us contained. It was interesting. Let's go back to the beginning and see what you remember. August 9th was the date that uh, Michael Brown uh, was shot mm -hmm. by the police officer, Darren Wilson. Now, you weren't there that very night. No. But what do you remember about first learning about that, and what were the first things that happened to you? Uh, he, he was shot around the noon hour, and I uh, had a birthday party to shoot that afternoon. So about 5 o'clock, I got a text from my son telling me that I need to look at this picture. And I'm thinking to myself, you know where I am. I'm working. I don't have time for this. And it was Michael Brown's stepfather with this sign saying that the police had just executed his son in the apartment complex. And I was like, what? What is going on here? So I kind of like discarded it. A couple other people text me to ask me that I know about this kid named Michael Brown being executed in this apartment complex. And again, I discredited it. But people that were at the party wanted to be going, what do you know about this guy named Michael Brown being mm -hmm. executed in this police, I mean, in this apartment complex, which made me realize, okay, there's something going on here. What is the problem with this? Because I'm thinking to myself, you know, homicides happen. What makes this homicide so special? It wasn't until I got a hold of my son that he said to me, a police officer did this. And that's when I thought, oh. And by the time I got home that night, it was all over the news. They were already talking about they're going to be meeting in front of the Ferguson Police uh, uh, Department the, the next morning, which was Sunday morning. And were you there for that? Yes, I was there for that. And that was like the start of where we are now. I mean, really, it, 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 it galvanized so quickly. The amount of people that were there that Sunday morning shocked me. I mean, we had 400 people, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, okay, folks are upset. We have a problem here. And it, it just got worse from there. Let's look at a couple more images that you took in Ferguson. Uh, this is the first night of the candlelight visual. Now this is Sunday night. That is Michael Brown's cousin, and she is hugging her son because of the fact that, you know, this is a relative. And this is where you're standing in the right place at the right moment. You know, you're, you're wandering around, and, and by the way, there's like 600 people present when this is happening, and which, which also made me realize that this is going to take a while. This is going to be over by the end of the week. This is going to be a minute. And that, that picture summed it up. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this is uh, two right. weeks ago. That's right outside the police station. Yes, it right? is. And, you know, every photographer knew you we got to get these guys in riot gear underneath that season's greetings. It, it just says so much. We have two more. Let's go ahead and look at those. Uh, this is the march that we did. Um, this is Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. And Kajimi Powell was the gentleman that was uh, murdered on Riverview which I thought that was a total execution. I really didn't appreciate the way the police handled that at all. I mean, a man with obviously mental issues, I didn't think he needed to be gunned down, especially by two officers. And uh, Chief Dobson said that he came inside 10 feet. And I'm thinking, yes, and you could have gotten back in your car, you could have backed up. There were a lot of things you could have done before you just execute a young man for carrying a knife. Uh, pictures like this, I like to hunt down. Uh, the, the little girl there, her name is Alice, and those are her adopted parents. And the one thing I've also noticed about, about this whole movement is that a lot of people have come out to show that they are in a mixed family situation. And when they say Black Lives Matter, when you see non-African Americans holding those signs, it means so much. And it, it means, too, that we need to really come together and understand that we're all in this together. We can't separate people by gender, race, or culture. Mm -hmm. You know, you actually were the vi uh, victim yourself at one time during this. Uh, a week and a half ago, I'm out shooting at the Ferguson Police Department, and a kid broke out my window. And I was very upset about that, so I said, okay, I'm done for the night. It's about 11 o'clock. I get home, take off my clothes, I'm in bed, I'm watching the news, I see that uh, South Grand at Arsenal has erupted, I put my clothes back on, <laughs> I go down there, I'm shooting, and I had already put plastic over my window, so I'm shooting, and when they tear gassed us, everybody started running, 
I'm standing next to a building. I'm shooting people running past me, and these three guys just come, come right at me and shove me right into the wall. And because it was on my camera side, they, they snap my camera, I mean, snap the lens off my camera. It goes rolling down the street. I'm trying to catch it, and a young lady accidentally kicked it into the street. So I'm trying to dodge people and grab my lens. I grab my lens, the bayonet's gone. I'm looking for it, only to find out five minutes later, it's still connected to my camera. So two incidents in the same night, that's just highly unlikely for me. I, I've never gotten in any kind of physical altercation or trouble while I've been shooting in the but whole But wasn't there another years. time with your son in your vehicle? Yeah, that was the time. Oh, that was the same yeah, time. Yeah, when, he, when the guy broke out my window, my son happened to be walking up to my car. Oh, I see. And he thought it wasn't my car because he didn't recognize the guy. He thought the guy was standing next to his own car. And he, and he said, I suddenly got close enough to realize that was my dad's car. How old's your son, Riley? 30. Okay, so he's not a kid. I was going to ask no. you what it was like having, having a, a child there, but he's not a child. But still, I mean, were, were there times that you were worried for your safety or your son's safety? I have two sons, 35 and 30. And I told both of them when they were teenagers, like most African Americans, male and female do, when you have sons, you let them know, okay, now that you have a driver's license, this is how you should respond to the police when they pull you over. Not if, but when they do, because they're going to. And, and I, I said that to him that night, I said, now you know, I know you've been out here a couple of times, but just stay with me, please, and don't get caught up in the emotion of it. And he, he, he was interested in watching the way it all went down. And, and especially my youngest kid, he's a bit of a radical. So I, I, I've always talked to him as a young boy that, you know, you need to watch yourself. Understand that when you're talking to a police officer that you need to be cordial and nice. As, and I even said to him one time, I said, eat it. Learn to eat it. Swallow it. And I said, you, I said cause I, I've always said to both my boys, don't come home to your mother and I dead right. Because hmm. that can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be right, but you can also wind up dead because of it. So whatever the police tell you, be on, on your best behavior. Is that a hurtful conversation in some ways? I mean, I know I guess you're giving them good advice, but the fact that maybe that you have to have it? The, the fact that you have to have it is kind of insulting to society, that we have to sit down with a certain segment of the community and say to them, this is how you're supposed to act when you leave the house because other people don't really care for you anyway, so you have to watch what you say and do. And I, I, every African-American male has been put, put over by the police unlawfully or even lawfully and had a situation where you're thinking, you know, this could have been done another way. You know, something I want to bring up, it so, sort of ties in in a way, talking about being an African-American in St. Louis. On a positive note, your dad has a little place in history of being an early um, black man in St. Louis radio. Mm -hmm. Maybe the first, maybe? He was. He was the first, 1944. And he was Wiley Price also. Yes. And uh, his uh, tagline on the radio was he was... Mrs. Price's boy, that's what he would say on the radio as he came on the air at uh, WTMV over in Belleville. Mm -hmm. And he only stayed in the business for six years. As a matter of fact, uh, Spider Burke was the second African American and my father was instrumental in getting him his job. And you can look up your dad in the St. Louis uh, Radio Hall of Fame with a uh, wall of Hall of Fame, excuse me, I'll spit it out. <laughs> and uh, Frank Apture, who I know pretty well, is the guy that puts that together and mm -hmm. you can find that online. Yes. Yeah. I want to ask you a couple of questions in conclusion, Wiley, and maybe we can roll through some of the shots we've already looked, mm -hmm. just sort of to recap. Um, as a journalist, a photojournalist, do you, I think I asked you this a little bit in the beginning about your responsibility to, responsibility to remain neutral, although you have feelings and emotions when you're out there in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everybody remains neutral, but inside you're thinking, oh, this is good or oh, this isn't right. So, you know, even sometimes I've had to talk to young people and say to them, you know, you're going to get more out of this if you calm down and stop yelling, you know. And, and situations always can, can, can always get out of hand when people get heightened in their emotions. Right. So from, as a bystander, when I'm shooting, I always try to stay calm. And I have my head on a swivel. I'm always looking around, particularly now, because it can come from anywhere. It really can. And, and over the years, all the homicides and fires I've shot, I've seen things go terribly wrong because I'm just standing there observing and covering it. And I, and I think to myself all the time when I go to a situation, and I, I listen to the scanner every day, all day. Mm -hmm. I, I listen to the police. I've never listened to North County as much as I have in these past three months. But, you know, when I, when I leave, I always say a little prayer to myself that, you know, please protect me. Wiley, just a couple of seconds it. left. But is there anything positive you can say to people that see this and, you know, 
worry about the way things are? Uh, you know, I, I would just say to people, we all want to be treated fairly. That's what this is all about. Everybody wants to be treated fairly, and they've actually earned that right being born in this country to be treated fairly. Well, we certainly appreciate uh, you documenting the trials and tribulations of our lives, because I guess that's really what you do. Yes, I do. Wiley Price, St. Louis American, and uh, a lot of these photographs have been published. Maybe go to the St. Louis American website would be a good thing to do for people to look. Wiley, thank you so much for sharing your story with us Thank today. you, Steve. Appreciate it. I'm Steve Potter. That's all the time we have for this edition of City Corner. Thanks for watching, and join us next time. Bye.